Good afternoon and uh, welcome to this panel addressing the topic of the environmental and socioeconomic factors of type 2 diabetes, which is held during this Royal Society of uh, Canada virtual symposium hosted by the University of Toronto to celebrate the discovery of uh, insulin. My name is uh, Jean-Pierre Despré and I will act as the moderator of this uh, session. I'm currently professor at the Department of Kinesiology of the Faculty of Medicine at Université Laval in Quebec City. I am also the scientific director of VITAM, a new research center on sustainable health affiliated with uh, Université Laval and embedded within a large healthcare network called Sius Capital National. This healthcare a service organization being responsible for pri providing primary care, social services, and monitoring the public health of our local population in the greater Quebec City metropolitan uh, area. I'm very grateful for this opportunity to chair what should be an interesting panel uh, discussion involving three academic physicians with considerable expertise on the topic and with complementary perspectives. I will introduce them in a few minutes, but before I do, I'd like to share with you a few personal thoughts regarding the topic to be addressed in this uh, session. You know, I'm an old uh, scientist, old university professor. I've been doing this for 35 years and my laboratory has been interested by type two diabetes, by its link to not only lifestyle factors such as nutrition, physical activity, but also genetics by the way people put on fat particularly the dangerous inner invisible body fat wrapping up or infiltrating your organs, such as your, your heart, your liver, your muscle, and fitting up your belly, the so-called visceral fat. My team has also been very much interested by the effect of uh, physical activity and exercise as approaches to prevent type 2 diabetes, or at least improve the health condition of patients living with type 2 diabetes. But unfortunately, 35 years later, I must share with you my disappointment. There's a huge gap between what we know and what we do for patients living with type two diabetes. Indeed, at a time where we have a, a better understanding of the link between our genes or diet or physical activity behaviors and type two diabetes, we're going through a worldwide epidemic of type two diabetes. For instance, in a, in a very near future, half a billion of individuals will live with diabetes worldwide. In this regard, studies have shown that we are unfortunately not equal when comes the time to evaluate our risk of developing type two diabetes and its uh, complication. It's now very well documented that there are major inequities. People of lower socioeconomic status being more affected by this uh, disease. Thus, even though remarkable progress have been made in our understanding of type 2 diabetes, its complication, its medical management, and its prevention require solutions to deal with this epidemic, maybe more in the social than in the medical domain. Therefore, the objective of the present panel is to discuss with our experts how it is key to address socioeconomic and environmental factors in order to better address the current epidemic of uh, type 2 diabetes. My hope today is that we not only identify issues with our panelists, but uh, that we also discuss potential solutions. At this stage, I'm thrilled to introduce our three panel participants. But before I do, let me mention that the four of us are also members of a CIHR funded network called Diabetes Action Canada, which aims at addressing with and for patients living with diabetes issues that are relevant to their health and uh, well-being. Uh, so our three panelists are, today are Dr. Jinan Booth, an endocrinologist from University of uh, Toronto, Dr. David Campbell, also an endocrinologist from University of Calgary, and Dr. Paul Rochon, who is a geriatrician at the University of uh, Toronto. Each of them will make a 10, 12 minute presentation and share some slides uh, with you highlighting some key issues relevant to the topic of our session. And we will then have an interactive uh, uh, period of Q&A uh, session. And if I may ask you to use the chat box 
to ask your question and whether the question is uh, uh, um, for a specific uh, panelist or for the, the, the whole panel. So it's my pleasure right now to introduce our first uh, speaker, Dr. Gillian Booth. She's a professor in the Department of Medicine and the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the University of uh, Toronto and a scientist in the MAP Center for Urban Health Solution at St. Michael's Hospital and ICES. Dr. Booth's research focuses on, on environmental, socioeconomic, and healthcare factors influencing the risk of diabetes and its complication. She has received numerous awards for research, including a tier Canada Research Chair in Policy Solution for Diabetes Prevention and Management. A major focus of our research is to understand how social and built environments influence the risk of type 2 diabetes and related disease. Dr. Booth has made major contributions to uh, diabetes policy and practice in Canada. She has held scientific advisory roles for the Public Health Agency of Canada, CIHR, and even the NIH, and recently joined the International Diabetes Federation Diabetes Atlas Committee, where she's leading the IDF Special Interest Group on Diabetes and COVID-19. So Gillian, we're very much looking forward to your talk. You're on mute, uh, Gillian. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you for that wonderful introduction and I'm thrilled to be here today. Um, I'm going to start off by talking about the environmental risk factors for type 2 diabetes development, specifically the built environment, which includes urban design, air pollution, and the retail food environment, as well as the interplay between environmental factors and socioeconomic status, and the use of population-based data to study these phenomena. So first I'm gonna to touch on neighborhood walkability and health. So we know that older, more traditionally designed neighborhoods have a lot of features that make them more conducive to walking. And these tend to be areas that have a high population density. And importantly, they're zones such that retail and other services are embedded within neighborhoods. So there's more places that people can reach by foot from the proximity to their home. This is an aerial shot, of course, of Manhattan showing a grid-like street pattern. You can see really short block sizes and a lot of connections between streets. In contrast, the newer suburban development over the last 30, 40 years has really taken a different shape and it has opposite characteristics. So lower population density, fewer street connections. And importantly, these areas are zoned purely for residential purposes, which means that Places you'd like to walk to, such as stores and, and other amenities may not be within walking distance. And there's growing evidence, including from researchers in Canada, including our team, that less walkable areas are associated indeed with less walking and lower levels of physical activity overall, as well as higher levels of obesity. And it also means more time spent in cars, which is a sedentary behavior but it also means less time and opportunity to be engaged in active forms of transportation, which is walking, cycling, and public transit. And in fact, the International Physical Activity and the Environment Study um, measured physical activity using objective measures, uh, accelerometry, and they found that in almost 7,000 adults living in 14 cities worldwide, that those who had the best environment, so higher levels of walkability and high access to transit and parks and trails accrued up to 90 to 100 more minutes per week of physical activity, moderate to vigorous physical activity, which is what we're supposed to be achieving every week. And in fact, it's about two thirds of what national guidelines recommend that we achieve. So there's been other innovative ways to measure physical activity worldwide, including this study that was published in Nature three years ago out of a team from Stanford. And what they did was they used smartphone data to look at physical activity levels in over 700,000 people worldwide. And if you look at the panel on the left, they looked at the distribution of step counts in different countries. And so for example, if you look at Saudi Arabia in red, as well as the UK and US, 
you can see that there's a lower mean step count than in a country like Japan in blue. But there's also a more broad and skewed distribution, meaning that very few people with very high step counts and a very large proportion of the population with low step counts. And so what they found is the countries with more of what they described as activity inequality had higher levels of obesity. And they also looked at cities and looked at how walkable cities increased your step counts. And so you can see on the panel on the left that walkable cities had uh, in green had higher step counts compared to uh, you know, less walkable cities. But they also found that the highly walkable cities had less activity inequality. So it could be that urban design that promotes walking actually can shift more of the population into being physically active. So it, it's a reasonable question to ask, is neighborhood walkability a risk factor for diabetes? So we've had the opportunity to look at this phenomenon using um, administrative data. So we use provincial health records from Ontario to look at all residents living in a given area and we can link neighborhood level data to them using their post code of residence. And then we can follow populations over time for, ad, for their health outcomes. And we used a novel walkability index using census data to capture population density and residential density, map files to look at street connectivity. And then we also looked at walkable destinations. So the number of stores and services that people can reach within a 10 minute walk um, from the center of their neighborhood. And using this approach, we found that walkable neighborhoods are experiencing a slower rise in obesity and diabetes. And this graph shows the adjusted prevalence of overweight and obesity among adults who are in the working age group in 15 cities in Southern Ontario. And if you look at the orange line, these are the most walkable neighborhoods and people in those neighborhoods had a 10% lower rate of overweight and obesity. And the rates were stable over time in comparison to less walkable areas where the rates were higher and, and actually still going up. The people in the most walkable neighborhoods also had a significantly lower rate or incidence rate of diabetes. And the only factor that we found that seemed to be explaining these findings were differences in transportation choices. So the people in the most walkable area had a much higher rate of walking and cycling, more trips per capita of public transit, and far lower numbers of car trips per capita uh, than those living in less walkable areas. Now we had followed people in neighborhoods, so following those neighborhoods forward in time. In this work by um, Samantha Hajna and colleagues in Montreal, they looked at people over time in the National Population Health Survey. And so if you look at the dashed line at the top, try and point that out, um, who lived consistently in low walkability areas over the 12 year period, they had the highest BMI and not surprisingly, their BMI went up over time, which is an artifact of aging. Um, but the people in the green line moved from a low to a high walkability during the follow-up and they had a more shallow increase in BMI over time. Whereas people with in high walkability areas the entire 12 years had a consistently lower BMI over time. But those who moved from a high to a low walkability area actually had a sharper increase in BMI. This is a systematic review by Nicole Den Braver from the Netherlands showing an overall 21% lower likelihood of type 2 diabetes in high walkability settings. This included a cross-sectional study from our team and two arms of a longitudinal study. Now, one of the advantages that we've had is using administrative data is a very large sample size. So in this study, we use data on 1.6 million men and women who are in the working age population living in Toronto. Now, we've been able to try to address because of the sample size, we've had the advantage of being able to address probably to a better degree, um, some of the you know, limitations in this research. So one is bias from self-selection. So that relates to the fact that people who prefer to live in, in suburban neighborhoods may be systematically different than those who prefer to live in urban areas. 
So we've used uh, statistical models to try and create balance between populations in different types of neighborhoods, including propensity score methods. And we still found that neighborhood walkability conferred a benefit after taking consideration of those differences. We also were able to look at subgroups in the population to see who's most susceptible. And it seems that consistently we found that young adults are more susceptible to environmental influences such as walkability. And that may depend on how people in different age groups um, interact with their neighborhoods and walk, but it also may be related to the fundamental differences in how people develop type two diabetes with younger people being more susceptible to the effects of obesity. We also found variation in the effects of walkability across ethnic groups. And this is the case of gestational diabetes. And looking at deciles of walkability, you can see that as you go to the highest deciles, there's a sharp decrease in the rate of gestational diabetes in pregnancy. But the rate of reduction was much greater for Canadian born women than for women born outside of Canada. Again, that may have to do with health behaviors and how much people walk during pregnancy, um, but there may be other influences, genetic as well as cultural or environmental. So in this study by Gazelle Fasley, who was doing her PhD with me, um, she found that prediabetes incidence was increased in low walkability areas among some, but not all ethnic groups, including South Asians, as you can see at the top, who are one of the highest risk groups for type two diabetes. And in this study, we followed people from normal blood sugars to the development of prediabetes. And um, we found that non-European populations had a higher risk, not unexpectedly, but um, that was particularly so for South Asians who were in the blue line at the top. In fact, one in three South Asian immigrants who were between the ages of 35 and 49 developed prediabetes over a 12 year period and these groups not only develop prediabetes at a higher rate, but they also convert to type two diabetes more rapidly and at a lower glucose level. We also know that the context in which people live their life matters and not all, not, not all neighborhoods are built the same, even if they look similar from the outside. And this is particularly true for low income neighborhoods where you know, those neighborhoods may have fewer resources that would support physical activity and healthy eating. And they may also have other confound or other factors that increase their risk of diabetes or reduce their ability to walk, such as higher stress levels and crime. We also found, and this is work by Nicholas Howell doing his PhD with me, that high traffic pollution uh, measured by NO2 concentrations negates the benefits of walkability on diabetes and hypertension. And Nick also found that smoking rates were much higher in high walkability areas, and that might offset the, ben the benefits that we actually observed in terms of cardiovascular disease incidence in high walkability areas. And then lastly, um, you know, if you live in a very walkable area, you can also walk to fast food. And this is work by Jane Polsky, who's now at Stats Canada. And what we found in her work is that people who live close or within walking distance of a fast food swamp, and that's an area that has high volume of fast food and very few other restaurants as that would be an alternative. And they found, and we found that there was a one and a half to two fold increase in rates of obesity, diabetes, and hypertension among those who live close to those areas versus those who do not. So I'm just gonna summarize by saying that environmental exposures play a significant part in the development of type two diabetes. The effects of neighborhoods on type two diabetes risk may vary according to the underlying susceptibility of the population to their environment and other factors. I'd like to also just acknowledge that a lot of students, project staff and co-investigators have contributed to this work as well as various funding organizations. And I'd like to thank you and I look forward to the panel. Thank you so much, Gillian, for this uh, beautiful talk, setting the stage, you know, the, the tone of the, the discussion we'll have this afternoon, clearly that we need to go way, way beyond the clinical model in order to properly address the 
the epidemics of uh, type 2 diabetes in, in our country and, and uh, worldwide. So for um, the, uh, the audience, again, please do not hesitate to use the, the chat box. We're going to have an interactive uh, discussion after the, the, uh, the talks, the lecture of our three uh, panelists. So thank you again, Gillian. So the second talk will be uh, given by Dr. David Campbell, who is assistant professor and clinical scientist in the departments of, of medicine at the Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism and Community Health Services at the University of uh, Calgary's coming uh, School of Medicine. Dr. Campbell is an endocrinologist with clinical interest in cardiometabolic endocrinology, diabetes, dyslipidemia, endocrine hypertension. He has a PhD in health services research and his research focuses on equity and access uh, to care. Specifically, he studies novel ways to deliver diabetes and chronic disease care to population which are currently underserved by our healthcare system. For instance, his postdoctoral research conducted at the MAP Center for Urban Health Solutions use a multi-method approach to better understand the challenges of managing diabetes in populations experiencing homelessness. Dr. Campbell's current projects range from clinical intervention, that is using diabetes outreach, uh, workers share medical appointments to large scale policy uh, intervention, for instance, co-payment elimination and facilitated really of uh, clinical information. David, we're very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Jean-Pierre, and it's a, um, a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon to speak in this distinguished panel um, on how socioeconomic factors impact diabetes management and outcomes in Canada. We're gathered here to celebrate the legendary and momentous work of Banting and Best in the discovery of insulin, which was nothing short of miraculous. A hundred years ago, insulin was absolutely life-saving for patients with the previously fatal type 1 diabetes, as Dr. Lewis laid out very nicely in his lecture this afternoon. Modern-day insulins continue to play an important role in the, uh, in the care of patients with diabetes, both type 1 and type 2. However, I would like to recognize the insight of the planning committee of this event to host this particular session, which has, a, has as its objective to highlight the many other contributors to diabetes outcomes. Nowadays, it is well recognized that insulin is only one part of a comprehensive diabetes management strategy that helps patients to achieve optimal outcomes and avoid the devastating complications that we all know can ensue from diabetes. Diabetes management encapsulates many other critical components, including adherence with multiple medical therapies, consumption of a healthy diet, regular physical activity, diabetes education, attending medical appointments, timely screening for complications, and the list goes on. Since diabetes management is far more complicated than taking insulin, there are many other factors that are important which contribute to one's ability to achieve therapeutic targets and avoid complications. While 100 years ago, whether someone had insulin or not was the main predictor of survival for a patient with diabetes, today the social determinants of health are the major drivers of adverse diabetes outcomes. The Public Health Agency of Canada estimates that only 15% of outcomes relate to biological factors, including medications, where the social and healthcare access factors are far more influential in patients' actual outcomes. The inequitable distribution of resources in our society impacts individuals' ability to follow through with various aspects of diabetes management, resulting in disparities in health outcomes for different segments of the population. The term structural violence, um, as described by medical anthropologist Paul Farmer, describes the situation in that structural violence is one way of describing the social arrangements that put individuals and populations in harm's way. The arrangements are structural because they're embedded in the political and economic organization of our social world, and they are violent because they cause injury to people. As Jean-Pierre referenced in his introduction, because the social determinants are so key to people's outcomes, I believe that while landmark biomedical discoveries, including that of insulin, are our discipline's legacy, I would like to suggest that the next frontier for improving diabetes outcomes are interventions on the social determinants of health rather than incremental medical or biological discoveries. While these are undoubtedly important and still ongoing, because the social determinants are so powerful and determine so much of people's diabetes outcomes, we get the biggest bang for our buck in addressing the social factors and structural violence. 
Structural violence has been demonstrated in Canada, even within our universal health care system. In this study, we demonstrated that um, those who face social and structural disadvantage are much more likely to have adverse diabetes related outcomes compared to people who have uh, different circumstances. We showed that Albertans who receive income support were actually four times as likely to require hospitalization for diabetes compared to those in the general population. And furthermore, that individuals uh, who were First Nations uh, were five times as likely to be hospitalized for diabetes compared to the general population. In another study where we linked uh, self-reported data from the Canadian Community Health Survey with administrative health data, we showed that 10% of Canadians experience a financial barrier to care to some aspect of their chronic disease, including diabetes management, and that those who experience financial barriers to care were considerably more likely to be hospitalized for diabetes and for cardiovascular disease causes um, up and by about 36%. Furthermore, we showed that these same people, those who had financial barriers, were 25% more likely to die of diabetes and cardiovascular disease compared to those who experienced no financial barrier to their care. We later went on to do a qualitative study where we spoke to people who faced financial barriers to care. And predominantly in those with diabetes, we heard two major themes, that people had a hard time accessing insulin medications and testing supplies, both of which we heard described at length already this afternoon. With regards to insulin, one patient said, I've stopped taking more insulin because I was supposed to continue to go up, but I've gotten to 300 units now, and that's just a whole, a whole disc for the pen, and I refuse to go over that. It's crazy the amount of insulin I'm taking, and it's very expensive. With respect to testing supplies, another patient said, they give me $600 a month in, in their benefits to help with, with the testing supplies, and they cost $90 a box. And I say I go through a box and a half a month. I said, I'm gonna run out. I'm not checking four times a day that the pharmacy required. Whenever things get tight, I quit buying strips. It, meaning the blood sugars have gone up. And I wonder what was my blood sugar up for? Oh yeah, because I didn't do my testing earlier. So clearly while the discovery of insulin was absolutely critical, there are still many challenges that our patients face today in terms of accessing insulin and all of the other things they require for the management of their diabetes. One specific population of individuals who face considerable financial barriers and social disadvantage are those who experience unstable housing and homelessness. In conjunction with people who have lived experience and those who provide health and social care to this population, we heard all about these barriers. In this table, you can see at a glance all the ways, the usual things we ask of our patients with diabetes listed across the top here, uh, healthcare visits, diabetes education, uh, medications, diabetes supplies, dietary adherence, and exercise are complicated and intersect with factors that are related to poverty and homelessness, including stigma and history of trauma, mental health, uh, lack of information, poverty, et cetera. As one specific example, we can look at specifically, oh, <laughs> sorry, um, specifically we um, heard about how housing intersects with uh, engaging with healthcare providers because healthcare providers don't have a way to get in touch with clients. We heard that housing intersects with medications because patients do not have um, places to store their medications or fridges to keep their insulin in and their items often get stolen uh, when they're living in communal environments. We heard about how not having a home intersects with th their diabetes supplies as they are not allowed to keep needles in their rooms off and in shelters. Again, items are often getting stolen and items get lost or left behind when these patients who are often very transiently housed move from one place to another. And really quite predominantly, we heard about how diet is impacted and that patients are often not allowed, or clients are often not allowed to keep food in their room. Um, the fridges are often lacking or not working, even in transitional housing units, and that food and cooking implements get stolen. And finally, many of these, as, as Jillian just laid out, many people do not feel that they can exercise in their communities if they live in areas where, where it's not safe to do so um, or they live in, in settings that are not conducive to engaging in physical activity. Home Sweet Homeless was a community-based participatory research project that we recently completed where community co-researchers with lived experience of homelessness and diabetes were given cameras and we asked them to take photos that illustrated how and why it was hard for them to manage diabetes while they were homeless. They then brought their photos back to us and we had them write narratives and tell their stories about the photographs that they took. 
Many of the issues raised by study participants were related to accessing diabetes friendly food while in shelter, as depicted in panel A, vending machines, which were reported by the participant to do brisk business in a shelter, which are ironically placed immediately adjacent to a diabetes education poster, and panel B, a very nutritious breakfast. The artist of this photo stated, I'm not asking for steak and filet mignon. I'm asking for some vegetables, fruit, and water, something that can effectively help me control my sugar. Participants often also sought emotional refuge in unhealthy food, as the contributor of panel C wrote, a large chocolate milkshake and two McDoubles provide the highlight of my day. Finally, even once people do get housed, they often still rely on food banks for sustenance. The author of panel D wrote concerning a food box received from her food bank, a, diabet a diabetic diet is supposed to be plant-based, but as you can see, fresh vegetables are potatoes. You'll see a bag of sugar surrounded by high sugar content products. In this study, we interviewed 96 providers who care for patients with diabetes and or homelessness across Canada to get a sense of novel and unique approaches to providing tailored or specialized diabetes care for patients who are experiencing homelessness. We heard about those who provide diabetes care in shelters and inner city pharmacies or with outreach teams that go out to find and provide care to patients. This is done both through the lens of primary care as well as diabetes specialty care. Given the many barriers that this population faces, the provision of effective diabetes care for this population is extremely challenging. And we found that there are three major cornerstones for this type of care. Patient-centered care, optimal organizational structures, and built-in navigational considerations. You can clearly see in this slide that the design and execution of a fully tailored diabetes care program for those experiencing homelessness is exceptionally involved and has yet to be implemented and evaluated rigorously. This image from the National Coordinating Center for the Determinants of Health demonstrates that some interventions like these tailored diabetes programs I'm speaking of are considered downstream interventions, meaning that they attempt to address the results of social inequity without addressing the root causes. While these interventions have the potential to improve outcomes, the ultimate cause of these problems are far upstream in in income inequality, food insecurity, and lack of opportunities, which is where ideal interventions need to be focused in order to minimize the impacts on, on diabetes outcomes at a population level. Upstream interventions also have the advantage of not only improving diabetes outcomes, but also other health and social states that are affected by the social determinants of health. My team is currently investigating two interventions to address disparities in clinical trials. In the ACCESS trial, we're studying the impact of reducing patient-borne medication costs through the elimination of medication co-payments for preventive medications, including anti-diabetic medications and insulin. Well, in the Healthy Food Rx study, we are attempting to address food insecurity by providing patients with targeted subsidies to be able to purchase healthy foods. The results of these trials are forthcoming. We are all here to commemorate and celebrate the discovery of insulin right here in Canada, which is truly worthy of celebration. However, we must not lose track of the fact that insulin is not enough on its own. As was highlighted earlier today, but is little known in the broader world, that Banting sold the patent rights of his incredible discovery to the University of Toronto for $1 with the intent that it could be made available to everyone. I postulate that we owe it to Banting and and to the other pioneers in our field to make the highest quality diabetes care available to all beyond just access to insulin. Wow, what a way to close your uh, lecture, uh, uh, David. Thank you for this reality uh, check. Uh, obviously, uh, many, too many patients in Canada, unfortunately, have to deal with so many issues uh, before, you know, having the ability or capacity to eat well and being active and to have uh, behaviors uh, compatible with, the, with their health. So thank you for, uh, again, that uh, reality check. Um, very much looking forward to the panel discussion that we're going to have uh, later on. So for the participant, you can see why I was so thrilled uh, at the perspective of uh, chairing this, this session uh, this, uh, this afternoon. So thank you again, David. So uh, our third uh, speaker will be Dr. Paula uh, Rochon, who is a geriatrician and uh, vice president of research at the uh, Women's College Hospital. She is a professor at the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto and is the 
inaugural RTOERO chair in geriatric medicine at the University of Toronto. Dr. Rochon research focus on understanding the unique needs of older uh, adults, particularly older women, and promotes their health and wellness. She has contributed to our understanding of aging and its impact both on uh, individual patient and the healthcare system. These contributions include highlighting the need to consider sex, gender, and age in research so that results are more relevant to older women and men and tailoring prescribing strategies to reduce adverse uh, drug events. Dr. Rochon has a strong record of federal funding and has published more than 300 papers in peer reviewed journal. She's the vice chair of the CIHR Institute of Aging Advisory Board and has received research distinctions, including being elected to the Canadian Academy of Health Science and being awarded the Eaton Clinical Research of the Year Award for 2020. Congratulations, Paula for the University of uh, Toronto. So Paula, the floor is yours. So thank you very much for that uh, lovely introduction. I'm going to be uh, focusing my talk on uh, older adults with diabetes. And there's uh, three areas that I wanna focus on today as part of that presentation. I wanna start by talking a little bit about what aging and diabetes look like and ask you to consider why over-treatment is a concern for older adults, particularly those in the long-term care home setting, and, and, and by discussing opportunities to improve the care that we provide, particularly to older people. So, uh, so when we look at, um, when we're looking at aging today, I think it's important to remember that Canada is about to be what we call a super-aged society. And that means that 20% of our population will be over the age of 65 by 2024. And I remember when I started talking about this, it, it felt like it was a ways away, but it's actually very, very soon. And we also know that about 20% of older people um, have diabetes, making aging such an important contributor to diabetes and perhaps something that we don't necessarily uh, think about on a regular basis. Now, when we look at um, who is providing care for this group, there are only about 304 geriatricians in Canada, which translates to about one for every 20,000 older individuals. So I am one of those geriatricians. And likewise, there's only about 588 endocrinologists for the entire population. Uh, so, you know, my colleagues on the panel are, are some of those endocrinologists. And I was reflecting on that when I was sort of thinking about this, this talk and uh, thinking back to when I was choosing my medical specialty. And actually, I had always originally wanted to be an endocrinologist, and I was going to pursue that as a career. And it wasn't until much later that I got interested in geriatric medicine. So I think it's kind of uh, interesting and natural that I'm very interested in the combination of people uh, who are both older and have uh, diabetes because that's something that's always been really important to me. And I think it is fair to say that the, despite the importance of aging and conditions that accompany it like diabetes, there are relatively few uh, geriatricians and endocrinologists to focus on this important uh, frail um, population. Now let's look a little bit at um, Canada more broadly. So Canada as a whole and looking at our aging population. So right now we have about six and a half million older adults in Canada. And there's some important pieces related to that. So one in four of these older adults currently live alone. And there's twice as many women who live alone. And this is important because women who live alone, about 40% of them describe themselves as being lonely. And loneliness is something that impacts health. And when we, when we think about um, diabetes, this is particularly important because it can also impact things like your medi medication management. And uh, this is something that I think is even more important now, you know, given our, our current circumstance uh, related to COVID, which we'll talk about uh, in a few minutes. So when we 
think about um, aging, I, I think it's also important. We often think about sex and, and that also relates to diabetes. So women are much more likely to live uh, in general with multiple chronic conditions. They're often prescribed medicines that people could be considered could be sort of inappropriate and as a result of that, they're more likely to experience uh, drug-related side effects. Yet it's interesting that it's actually men that are more likely to have uh, diabetes. Uh, and this is, this is something that we don't always think about it, but it's something that is really important, especially when we think about aging. So let's look at that a little bit more and look about, at diabetes in older adults. And we have data here from Canada. It's interesting. I must say that we found it's, it's sort of difficult to get some of this information, uh, but this is information we have for Canada. When you look at older adults, and when we talk about older, we're generally talking about people over the age of 65, about 16% of those uh, older individuals with diabetes are women. And in contrast to that, we have about 23% of older adults with diabetes in Canada who are men. Uh, so you can see that uh, kind of uh, the differences here between women and men. Another piece about diabetes, which I think is really important, is that it also illustrates how good drugs used in potentially inappropriate ways can be problematic. Uh, I think from you heard, what you heard from our, our last presenter, is how important um, drugs like insulin have been, like they're incredibly important, good drugs. But also these drugs are responsible for uh, the most um, adverse drug events that lead to emergency department visits for older adults. So anti-diabetic agents are amongst the top three classes of medicines that are responsible for the most adverse drug events in emergency rooms. So this too is something that we need to think about when we're thinking about uh, older people in particular. Now, when we talk about older adults, I think it's also important to think about long-term care. Um, as a geriatrician, I had about 16 years of experience working uh, in a long-term care um, home where I, I cared for many, many, many older people. And this really influenced my thinking about the importance of not over-treating frail older adults with diabetes. During that time, I became aware you know, in so many different ways of the impact of potential over-treatment and how that leads to pre preventable adverse events. And I, I remember in particular a case of an, an older physician who was admitted to long-term care with diabetes and confusion. And uh, this physician had been keeping his blood sugars under very tight control to avoid long-term complications. But we became aware that this tight control that he was doing was also very much responsible uh, for recurrent episodes of hypoglycemia. And this was making his cognition and his confusion worse. So, you know, definitely a, a problem that needed to be dealt with. Now, diabetes, uh, Canada has created some really good clinical practice guidelines and they indicate in these that over a quarter of Canadians in long-term care residents have diabetes. So it's even a, a higher group um, uh, than in the general population. So minimizing the harm associated with overtreatment in this vulnerable population is really critical. And I think that is an important point because in the long-term care environment, uh, the residents tend to be of advanced age. Their average age is well into the 80s. They're often frail or described as frail. Almost 70% of them have dementia and they, and they do have a limited life expectancy. So the way uh, their treatment needs to be um, thought of in that regard. So Dr. Ileana Lega, who's an endocrinologist, uh, here in Toronto is focusing on, on older adults and has conducted some really important studies on overtreatment in older people, uh, which uh, she defines as intensive glycemic control. So about one in five people in Ontario who are 75 years of age and older with diabetes, do you have evidence of potential overtreatment? And 
this overtreatment in turn is associated with a doubling in the risk of developing serious outcomes. So it's very important to reevaluate the glycemic targets and reconsider how we use medications uh, in this very uh, vulnerable population in order uh, to reduce the risks of hypoglycemia. And I, to emphasize, this is something that's very, very true and very important for those who are frail, those who have dementia, or, or those who are approaching the end of life, where the focus should really be on the patient's goals of care. Look, now, in terms of overtreatment and why that's important, I think the risks of overtreatment that include things like hypoglycemia are so, so important for older people. And that's because it really does increase their risk of falls and that leads to fall related injuries. It could also uh, lead to worsening confusion like the case that I mentioned uh, to you earlier. And overtreatment is much more common than undertreatment in older adults. And as we've said, it's anti-diabetic agents are cause of, common causes of this uh, hypoglycemia in not only in occurring in people's homes, uh, but in the hospital and in the long-term care setting. So something that's very important to look at. Now, I don't think we can talk about um, older people right now without thinking about some of the challenges that older people have, have experienced as a result of COVID-19. There's so many uh, different, different uh, challenges that have come forward, but it's things like uh, having limited access to routine health care. You know, it's either that the health care is not available to them right now because of COVID, or they don't want to go seek it out because also they're concerned about COVID. It's related to, to things that maybe we took for granted before, but being able to access groceries and be able to access fresh food becomes difficult uh, when, when there's social distancing and, and people are being asked uh, not to get out. And that also impacts things like uh, activity and exercise where um, people are not able to do the kinds of things that they would normally do, and that can lead to loss of strength, which is so important. And it also may mean that caregivers are not able to come and assist with medication management, and that too can lead uh, to many different problems. And when we think about people um, in the long-term care setting, uh, often they're being asked to stay in their rooms and they're not having the usual caregiving staff. And as a result of that, um, people may not be aware of changes in the way uh, of their conditions, things that might get missed. And that may lead to less attention to their diabetes management. And again, making them more at risk for problems like uh, hypoglycemia and other issues uh, related to their diabetes that are really important and things that we wanna prevent. So what are some of the things that we can be thinking about when we're looking at um, diabetes and thinking about older people? So it's clear now that uh, guidelines that are out there for diabetes management uh, for older adults, adults are increasingly talking about the need for less stringent hemoglobin A1C targets for older people. Particularly, we're talking about those who are frail those who are, have dementia, those with limited life expectancy, where the focus should really be on quality life of life and their goals of care that they bring forward is important to them. So strategies need to focus on that. And the goal here is really to think about how do you prevent hypoglycemia? But we also need to think about how do we promote activity and opportunities for engagement, especially when we know but during COVID-19, as, as an example, so many people are lonely and we need to find ways to keep them engaged so that we can reduce the impact of loneliness on health and in particular on things like their diabetes management. So to wrap up here, I want to make uh, I, I, the, the whole point of what we're talking about here is to think about older adults a large proportion of older adults have diabetes and frail older adults, particularly those who are in long-term care settings, need less aggressive diabetes treatment that aims really uh, to prevent the problems related to over treatment and to prevent in particular hypoglycemia. 
and optimizing the way we care for this growing number of older adults in our country and internationally with diabetes needs to be a priority for us going forward. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paula, and thank you uh, to the three of you uh, listening to your talks. You know, came the idea. I think this should be encapsulated in a in a paper, actually, to to show the importance of addressing the the next frontier. To your, your to use your your term, David, uh, I like that um, a lot. So I'll ask the participant, those of you who have questions, to use the the chat room. Meanwhile, I may I may go with the first one. Actually, that that would be for the three of you from your, you know, uh, uh, respective uh, perspectives. Um, COVID uh, as this, this viral crisis has uh, exposed individuals who are vulnerable. Uh, and I'd like now you to, and you mentioned that Paula, but the, the three of you from your perspective, Vulnerabilities, how, how do you translate that to provide the, the audience with, with example, you know, vulnerabilities in terms of, uh, you know, where you live, uh, the, your living condition and uh, issues that you uh, have addressed, Paula. Maybe if you start, uh, Gillian. Sure. Um, well, obviously, I think the data coming out about COVID is showing that it's more common, like infection rates are higher in people from lower income communities. These may be people because they are holding multiple jobs or in essential services, but they may also have a disadvantaged environment where they can't physically isolate as much. But the other concern I think that over time we're gonna see is that people living in disadvantaged environments so lower income places or less opportunities for walking and, and taking care of yourself is that we might see a bigger spike in pre-diabetes and diabetes and other chronic disease down the road in these populations because of fewer options to kind of combat the self-isolation and, and its effect that it's going to have on our ability to you know, keep up a healthy lifestyle and, and prevent diabetes. David? Absolutely. I have a number of perspectives. I mean, as a clinician, I've seen um, varying impacts of COVID on some of my patients. Um, you know, some of my lower income patients who were previously working two and three jobs and working crazy hours in the meat packing plants, etc., had a very hard time managing their diabetes. And kind of once they were able to get the, you know, the income support through the government programs and didn't have to work as much, I actually saw an improvement in some people's ability to self-manage because they didn't have the same competing demands on their time. Um, so there may be some of these kind of counterintuitive impacts that we might end up seeing. And I certainly have seen that in my clinical practice. The other thing that I've seen in my practice is I practice in a, a vulnerable, you know, a neighborhood full of people with social disadvantage, many um, Indigenous Canadians, many immigrants, and also just lower income folks. And my diabetes no-show rates are, are usually through the roof. And, you know, part of that has to do with our wait times to get in to see diabetes specialists. And by the time they get to their appointment with me and with, with my team, um, it's no longer a priority or top of mind for them, given all the challenges they face. But um, actually, what I've found is now that we've been offering predominantly virtual visits, and, you know, I use that term very loosely because there's certainly um, many of these folks I'm talking about don't have access to the same virtual technologies that we do, but we offer a lot of telephone visits. And I found that my no-show rate has gone from... 30, 40% to virtually zero, because I can get a hold of people on the phone most of the time and I can provide care that way. And so we're actually studying the impact of, of providing a broadly defined virtual visit. And there's like, some emerging literature about that, that actually like, people's accessibility to healthcare services may be improved because of some of these spillover effects from COVID that we, we hadn't anticipated. So there may be some silver linings in this, but by and large, absolutely. There's a tremendous number of people that are without work, tremendous number of people that are struggling with income in inadequacy right now. Uh, social isolation is a huge problem and all of those things will have negative effects on diabetes. So while there may be a few of these silver linings, I'm, I'm expecting that we're going to see a tidal wave of diabetes complications um, that we'll mm -hmm. see in later stages because we also know that people are, are shy and hesitant to come to acute care settings these days with 
with the outbreaks that are often happening. Um, and so we're not seeing people until later in the courses of their disease, I think. So it will be very interesting to study, but I think it's, um, we need proactive solutions because it looks- Excuse me, I don't know why they're not just telling me, I just said like it about, I don't know what they want. Can you Hold make sure that they can ask them because I- like Sorry, I may I ask the person? I'm involving uh, myself in this, but I don't really want to be the one. Not the can You're mute, I guess, unless you have a question. Setting up a live stream. <laughs> All right, so so I'll go. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, John Pierre. With you, are you able to hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Now, I think what you talked about in terms of COVID is uh, is, and I think it relates to to all of the things that we talked about. It really has exposed what I would say the inequities in our society, whether it's about where you live, or whether it's about your housing, or whether it's about how older people are treated, um, you know, it's really exposed all of that. And uh, certainly the long-term care environment has, has uh, you know, been, been so incredibly devastated by, by COVID-19. And as we said, that's where a lot of people with diabetes are. And uh, one of the issues there has been around staffing and having enough people available to provide the care, which we know is so important for older or frail people, especially when people have a chronic condition like diabetes and not being able to pr provide that care. As a result of that, you know, long-term care was where 80% of all of the deaths that occurred in Canada occurred. And, you know, that's, um, that just sort of speaks to, I think, some of the inequities that are happening there. And I think it's, it's just raised for all of us to think about you know, the many, many issues that have always been there systemically that we've known about, uh, just as we have about walkability and just as we have about homelessness and, you know, what happens when a, a circumstance like this arises and it makes us go back and just realize how important it is to address those issues if we really are looking to improve health in the population. Now going, uh, you know, Going uh, discussing further this issue, we have we have a, a point made in the chat box, and uh, I'd like to use the few minutes remaining to actually leave the audience on a positive note because uh, the point with, uh, made in the chat box is that we're we're raising those issues, but uh, let's talk about solutions now. And obviously, this would take another another uh, session. We know that uh, because uh, uh, now we are more and more aware, you know, several of us are more aware of the importance of, again, socioeconomic environmental factors that solutions are explored, you know, and uh, I'll start by Jillian, you know, who has, uh, has quite a bit of impact in many, many cities and including my hometown here, Quebec City. Jillian has had quite a bit of an impact. I can tell you that. Jillian? Oh, well, thank you. Um, so I think that the point in the chat was very uh, prescient. Obviously, we can describe problems. And I think that, you know, we have to think of the solutions. And I think in my area that I describe, it's really challenging because we're talking about the way you build communities. But there are changes happening. And there are actually, uh, you know, provincial standards and uh, starting to see a trickling down in terms of really progressive thinking around what kind of community development happens. Even in suburban areas like in Peel, they've taken a really, really forward thinking approach to actually reassign um, priorities to developments. So when developers put in their submissions now, if they don't actually do a health impact assessment, or consider the walkability of the area and the density, they're actually gonna get kind of a low rating and they may not get through. So it's a kind of a slowly evolving process, but I also think there's a lot more that can be done in terms of what we talked about with COVID. There's some cities thinking around, you know, being more proactive in terms of shutting down, you know, car lanes and putting in more kilometers of street paths. Um, Barcelona is looking at these sort of um, very green, low emission, like low traffic zones. I think there's a lot of things that can be done. There's more that could be due to reach people in terms of online opportunities for physical activity, all sorts of things. Um, so your point's not lost. I think that we are making some headway and we're starting to think about it and put health on the agenda. 
and to put it into that sort of health and all policies perspective, because that's where it really belongs. David, your perspective? My take is, you know, I, I see some clear parallels between what we're talking about today and and the work of of Banting and Best and McLeod that, you know, they built on the, the shoulders of people who'd come before them. And I think it, Gary Lewis highlighted that nicely, that there were many people that preceded Banting and highlighting the pathophysiology and the basic science that led this clinical mind to think, well, if we know Know why this happens and we can you know, come up with solutions and and that's kind of how I see my career I see that there have been giants in this area including Dr. Booth who I had the privilege of, of working with during my postdoc who've done groundbreaking work to show these disparities and and I'm really excited by taking that the next step to say okay well now that we know these problems and these disparities exist what can be done about it and that's why a lot of my work is focused on on developing and testing interventions to address social and um, structural inequities um, and, and as I kind of mentioned at the end of my presentation, I think these need to happen at all levels. Jillian's talking about very upstream things that are critical about how we build and develop cities. But as she said, that's very slow moving work. And I think that needs to happen. But I think that um, many of us that you know, see patients on a day-to-day -day basis get a little bit impatient with a lot of these kind of public health and population health measures. And we want things that we can implement and do to help our patients on the ground right now. And you know, Paula touched on some of those things and recommendations for how to improve care for, for vulnerable people. And so I think it needs to be, you know, uh, an attack on all fronts that we need to address the upstream and downstream factors. I'm really excited by the work that many of us are, are doing these days to acknowledge the work that's been done, but moving on from there to say, how do we, how do we fix this and address it? Paula, I know we're running out of time, but I wanna hear from you before we, we close the session. So thank you. And uh, I think for thinking about older people, uh, I think the good news is that we are thinking about that now. We are asking some of those questions and we're looking at how do we refine care for older people to make it uh, better for them. And sometimes the idea of, um, as we say, having less stringent controls actually works better. So that's really important. And then thinking about places like long-term care, I think this is an opportunity to really reimagine how long-term care should be designed in order to help people you know, promote the health and wellness and give them the space and, uh, and the things that they need to be able to maintain their health. And it would be good for, for all, but it would also be very good for people with diabetes. So thank you. And uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time. It has been a great privilege for, for me to, to chair this, this session. I guess you, are, you have perceived, I hope you have perceived that again, there's a whole bunch of solutions that are not in the medical domain, but in the social domain. And we need to build a, a better world with and for Canadian. And, you know, I'm optimistic because uh, not only are we raising uh, problems here, but uh, several of us are committed to make this country a better country with and for uh, Canadians. So on that note, I'd like to thank our panelists and thank you for your participation. This is not the last time we will discuss this. Thank you. Thank you.